it's not just professional singers who need to use their voice. Talk a little bit again about just the amount of people that fall under that professional voice user category. Sure, great question, but uh, it's, it's most of our people nowadays when you think about it. We have the tip of the pyramid, the very tip top, that's our professional singers who watch on TV and go to their concerts. We have people like you who are performers but at a talking level and not a singing level. And then below that we have people like our front desk people. Their voices are critical to their job. Their horse, they can't do their job. I am barely a professional voice user because I can be very hoarse and do what I want to do. We think construction workers, oh, they don't need a good voice, but imagine the foreman, the contractors. They're not just yelling, but they have to project distances over the sound of machinery. Their voice, they're professional voice users in a very difficult environment. So there's a lot more professional voice users than we ever used to imagine. Plus, our society has changed. We're a communication society now, whether or not it's verbal, whether or not it's texting and computers. We used to be factory workers, farmers, builders, that percentage of the population has gotten smaller while the communication part of our society has revved up, whether or not it's vocal, like we're talking today, or electronic. I would imagine that there's a lot of different things that encompass being hoarse. So when we strain our voices or we say that we're hoarse, what are the different things that are happening? Is it just one thing or is it multiple things that happen to your vocal cords? Sure, can be a lot. Can be a all over. Yeah, like I said, it starts with the lungs. You know, a whole lot of things can cause you. Yeah, hoarseness is, is a perceived abnormality or a change in your voice. That's it. And so, so it, it can be subjective or objective. People come in here with normal voices and they go, no, it's completely different than it was six months ago. Okay. Or some people can have bad voices, but it's them. For example, what's a good example of that? Uh, Demi Moore. You know, she's got a very rough, low-pitched voice. A lot of people find that very attractive. Yeah. If you fixed her voice, it wouldn't be her. That's part of her persona. A lot of, a lot of blues singers, a lot of older singers have very, very um, deep, resonant voices. A lot of that's because they actually have vocal cords that are damaged, but it helps them produce the sound. So if you fixed their hoarseness, you'd ruin them. Right. So everything, everything's different. So for us, we divide hoarseness into a... Uh, the cause of hoarseness into a variety of things. We talk about inflammatory disorders, number one. And what's that? Upper respiratory infections. Someone just gets a cold. You're hoarse for 48 hours, then you're back to normal in most cases. So, upper respiratory infection, you, irritants, you know, um, other inflammatory things, um, smoke, exhaust, in environmental changes, uh, acid reflux is a significant inflammatory uh, uh, thing. There are lumps and bumps, and lumps and bumps can be benign or cancerous. And so, risk factors for cancer, smoking, drinking, that can getting older, that kind of thing. But a lot of people get benign bumps. They can be polyps, cysts, those type of things. And those can be addressed with speech therapy, sometimes with surgery, that type of thing. We have neuromuscular problems. Uh, Volcoids, when we see yours, they open and close symmetrically. If one side's a little weaker than the other, then that can make you hoarse. If one side's paralyzed, that can give you a very weak, breathy voice. And so those are motion abnormalities of the vocal cords. There are, that they're a big deal. Plus there are neuro neurologic problems that aren't voice box related, but they're brain related. And for us, the most common would be Parkinson's. Oh, and people have that very soft Parkinson's voice that doesn't have a lot of pitch range to it. And so that's a problem we address a lot. We have a large Parkinson's center here at, at uh, Augusta University, and we see a lot of Parkinson's patients that have voice and swallowing disorders. So there's a host of things uh, that trauma, and for example, you know, you, you mentioned with yourself hollering and yelling and then having to go on the air. Um, so trauma can cause swelling the vocal cords, it can cause burst blood vessels that can make someone hoarse. And sometimes those burst blood vessels alter the vibration of the vocal cords. Sometimes you can grow tiny little polyp from that. Wow. So there are a lot of things that cause hoarseness. Young singers, or people who use their voice a lot, or people that are singing out of range is very common. An alto that has, has to be a soprano, they'll get nodules. Okay, and that's common in cheerleaders. Using their voice a ton will develop little tiny calluses in the vocal cords. So we see a lot. It's a lot of variety here. Is there, um, 
there, I would imagine there's no one treatment fits all of all those things that you just no, talked about. No. Is there a common thread maybe in there for a treatment? Absolutely, absolutely. What is that? We go through, if you will, just levels of treatment. The nicest thing would be to be able to give someone some medicine to make them better. Pretty rare for voice disorders. Mm -hmm. Very uncommon, but some people um, are taking medications that make them dehydrated. So it's the, sometimes it's as simple as drinking more water to make their improve voices, but that's uncommon. Um, reflux is rarely a, 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 the primary cause of hoarseness, but it contributes to a lot of people with hoarseness. So sometimes we talk about diet and lifestyle changes in some types of anti-reflux therapy. But the first thing after routine stuff like that is to work with one of our speech language pathologists. And it's we're a team with our speech language pathologists uh, because they work with our patients on technique. And it sounds silly. I, we have patients, I don't know how to talk. You think I'm crazy? And, but it's amazing. But anybody can go see a speech therapist and improve their voice 10, 15, maybe even 20%. It's really how to coordinate breathing with relaxing the muscles and let them do what they're supposed to do. Anybody can do the little trick, for example, to understand the importance of breath support. You take a deep breath. One, two, three, four, five, six. Just start talking out loud at a, at a certain pace and a certain level of loudness. Or do this. One, two, three, four. Try to do the same thing after you've let all the air out of your chest. Rarely can a person get halfway. So if you can count to 21 or 22 with a full chest full of air, then you let all the air out and try. Most people can't make it to 10 or 11. It's a way of just proving to you how important this is. Some people you tell them, take a deep breath before you talk. So what do they do? <sighs> One, two, three. So you, it's really training and learning to relax the muscles. And they'll have exercises, they'll have better techniques. So that is the, the foundation to a lot of our voice work. And even if we're having, doing surgery, speech, a single session of speech therapy before surgery is sometimes critical to get them to lose the bad habits they have developed. Imagine if you have a bump on one vocal cord and they're having to squeeze tighter. If I take that bump off, they don't magically stop squeezing. They still wake up talking the same way. So working with a speech therapist before and often after surgery is key to me getting good results. So we as surgeons like to think it's our work that's doing it, but if we didn't have the speech language pathologists working with them, our results would be much, much worse than they are. So if they, so if they start with speech therapy and that doesn't work out or it's not enough to meet their needs, then certain things require surgery. Certain things don't require surgery and if speech therapy doesn't help, we're kind of, what do we do now? Um, but more often than not, that's the stair-step approach we take. So, you know, standard, you know, clean living, if you will, routine stuff with diet, lifestyle, maybe some medications, good hydration, then speech therapy and then different types of surgical interventions, some that are very simple, low risk, some we do in the office. We can do a lot of surgical procedures in the office. Some have to go to the operating room. Some are done through the mouth. Some we actually have to open up the neck to do voice procedures on people. So there's a really a, a huge um, number of different types of surgical procedures we do for people with voice disorders, depending on the diagnosis. Right. Um, and you, you touched on this a little bit with um, blues and jazz musicians, but so much of our voice, I likened it, is so much of your persona. I mean, obviously the way that you look visually is probably the number one identifier of who you are, but then I would say second is audibly how you mm -hmm. sound. If my mom calls me on the phone, I can't see her, but I know that it's her. <laughs> Talk about that element, just how it defines us as us. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a great comment. A lot of folks look at the voice as being a, almost a measure of wellness in a lot of people. And so that a healthy person, strong, robust voice. You, you know, as people get older or if they've had strokes or as they get older, they get the weak voice. They can't talk as long without taking a breath. It, it really is a big reflection of it, and we take it for granted. And we talk about that a lot as, as voice physicians, as speech therapists and surgeons working people is everyone takes their voice for granted, even you, until you lose it and all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And so we love to, to see people when they're younger going into professional voice um, professions um, to have them work with speech therapy. 
to get them using good techniques as they're younger. So a lot of the singers at the university will see, even though they're not having trouble, just to get a baseline exam on them, just to have them talk to our speech therapist, just to learn education. And then like you said, it becomes who you are, it's your identity. More so, the more you depend on your voice. For me, although people recognize it, that know me, it's not my identity, you're different. People listen to you on television, singers have a very certain persona uh, that's, you know, you hear them, you know immediately who he or she is. And then accents play into that, but that's a whole other ball game, that we, you know, <laughs> the manipulation of accents and that kind of thing. Um, is there something, okay, so like I said, with, with Tony, I was like, I really want to do that story. I want to find like a new, like a why now, a today mm -hmm. bag. And I'm like, okay, the day before the George South Carolina game is a great time yeah, to do it. Tony, I go, what? <laughs> yeah, because tonight mm -hmm. is Border Bash, and some yep. people are going to be, you know, singing with the band, yelling with the cheerleaders, and then for those people who are then mm -hmm. going, like my husband and I, to the game tomorrow, that's two days back to back, potentially, mm -hmm. of yelling, and even just the one day of yelling for your team. Sometimes mm -hmm. my husband doesn't lose his voice very frequently, but sometimes <laughs> he'll come back from a tailgate. Mm -hmm. After talking all day to family and friends over live music at a tailgate and yelling for his team, are there things you can do proactively? Um, obviously, seeing a speech therapist and learning the techniques will help, <laughs> but are there things that you can do proactively at home our viewers can adopt to protect their voices? Sure, well, that's, that's a great question. But we call, call that you know, voc voice or vocal abuse mm -hmm. it is, is what we're talking about there. Right. And it's, it's, once again, it's super common. Uh, that's Notre Dame, Georgia game. If you were, if you came in our clinic, a lot of us were hoarse. How <laughs> you can imagine? Um, but it's it's tough, you know. You because other than just behavior modification, there's not a lot of magic, yeah. you know. But you think about what you do when you know you're not just pushing it for hours, but you're not drinking enough water. You're probably drinking a lot of other stuff that are good, it's going to dehydrate you, yeah. and so you add a little dehydration. You're tired, and then you're just pushing your voice, pushing your voice, and then. You know, we, we were fortunate, we were at the Notre Dame Georgia game, you know, hollering and yelling, and you know by the third quarter, you're already a little hoarse, but you don't stop. You keep pushing it, right. and, and then the next day, you wake up and, oh boy, what happened? So there's not at all a magic there. I mean, yeah. we don't want everyone having amplifiers. Everyone has megaphones there. They're going to have to shut the stadium down. Right. <laughs> but there's nothing other than just trying to avoid it that, that will fix that. Are some people more predisposed than others to, not even just by profession, biology? Um, does some people's anatomy say that I'll lose my voice easier than what you will? Yeah, well, I think, I think it is. We, we talk a little bit about this in some of our meetings, but I think it is. Uh, if you've got a eight-cylinder car engine and you want to go up, up a hill or do a long drive, you're going to, be, you're going to do that pretty well, okay? Yeah. But if you've got a car and a couple cylinders aren't working right, you've got, you've got a problem with your um, tires, this, that, you're more likely, if you try to force that car up that big hill, you're more likely that something's going to break. And so the voice is the same way. A, a healthy person with a good larynx, good lungs, is less likely to damage something. But if you have a weakness of your larynx on one side or the other, if you've had prior surgery, so you have a little area of scar, well, you're not 100%. You may be at 97, 96, but you're not 100%. Probably the most common thing we see is if you had a recent illness. So if you had an upper respiratory infection, so you've got a little hoarseness from that because you develop a little swelling on the edge of the vocal cords. If you then tailgate and scream and holler, you've got a great chance of damaging uh, of the vo something on your larynx. And the other thing is women. Women have a higher percentage or a higher likelihood of having a vocal cord hemorrhage. What that is, is you develop a blood vessel in the vocal cord, pops. You don't spit up blood. This is like a, you got, you got kicked in the shin, you got a bruise. The vocal cords had the exact same appearance as a bruise on your elbow or your shin. They turn black and blue. Then over the period of weeks, they become lighter and more yellowy, and then they come back to normal. So, so women, we think due to hormonal reasons, are more likely to pop blood vessels. And so when people tell you, you know, I was, I was yelling or I was singing and suddenly I got hoarse, or the next day I wake up hoarse and it stayed persists, it's not rare that that's, the f they pop the blood vessel. So women are more disposed, predisposed to that huh. than men. That is really interesting. Yeah, we published a series many years ago when I was a fellow, we published a series looking at years of vocal cord hemorrhage 
and 90 some percent were women.